Antarctica is the coldest, windiest, and most pristine place on Earth. While many of us may never travel to that far-off continent, millions of whales, seals, and penguins live there in the Ross Sea. In fact, here's a data point for you. More than 9,000 species that can't be found anywhere else in the world call it home. I'm Dan LaDuke, and this is After the Fact from the Pew Charitable Trusts. In this episode, you're going to learn a lot more about this distant, harsh, but also entrancing place. Just over a year ago, 24 countries and the European Union made history by creating the world's largest marine protected area in the Ross Sea through the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources. That's also known as CAMELAR. This decision safeguarded more than one and a half million square kilometers. That's a half million square miles, an area bigger than Alaska. But that was just the beginning. The Southern Ocean, the southernmost waters on the planet, is even bigger. It's also one of the fastest warming places on Earth and increasingly vulnerable to commercial fishing and pollution. To guard against these threats requires international cooperation. So Pew recently brought together leaders and advocates who played a vital role in bringing about the Ross Sea's protections to discuss what's next for this important region of the globe. In this special rebroadcast of that event, you'll hear from the former president of Costa Rica and other leading advocates for ocean conservation. Andrea Kavanaugh, who leads Pew's work in Antarctica and on our Southern Ocean, tells you who they are. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate to see you all here today. My name is Andrea Kavanaugh, and I direct Antarctic and Southern Ocean conservation work here at the Pew Charitable Trust. And I am thrilled to have this esteemed panel here with us today to talk about the celebrating the Ross Sea Marine Protected Area and to talk about Antarctic MPAs in general, and more importantly, how to get more of them. Uh, I want to get right into it, but first I do want to extend a warm and special welcome to, in particular, to guests from the embassies of Norway and New Zealand, and to Evan Bloom from the U.S. State Department in particular. Evan, you, along with others from the U.S. and the New Zealand government, were instrumental in shepherding this proposal through many years to get it designated. So without you, we would have nothing to celebrate. So thank you so much, Evan. <laughs> And really, there are so many people here in the room and who are watching us either on Facebook Live or through the webcast who worked long and hard to make the Rossi MPA a reality. And it's not surprising because Antarctica inspires a passion. I've certainly caught that bug, and I think everyone up here has as well. It's a place of extremes. It's the coldest and the windiest place on the Earth. It's a desert. And there are more than 90 active volcanoes, many of them miles deep underneath the ice sheets. And the southern ocean that surrounds the continent is home to species that are found nowhere else on Earth, some that are still being discovered. It also is a place that inspires extreme feats of daring, adventure, and endurance. We're looking at you here, Lewis, for that. It fosters a spirit of cooperation, and that's reflected in many ways, particularly in scientific discoveries, and in the recognition that this place warrants special protection. After all, at the height of the Cold War, the world came together to safeguard Antarctica for all of humanity as a place of peace and science. But the waters that surround it were left unprotected. So maintaining the pristine state of the Southern Ocean is vital for marine life like whales and penguins and the very tiny but mighty krill, which is why the 25 member governments of the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources decided that they needed to form a network of marine protected areas in the Great Southern Ocean. And in 2009, Camelar designated the very first high seas marine protected area in an area around the South Orkney Islands. And in 2016, the reason we're all here to celebrate, after years of negotiation, they established the world's largest protected area on the planet in the Ross Sea. However, large areas of the Southern Ocean are still unprotected, leaving the region vulnerable to human activities like fishing and um, pollution. Climate change, of course, in the region is just making things worse. So to guard against these threats, the international community must work together to ensure that the East Antarctic MPA is designated this year at Camelar, and that the Weddell Sea and Antarctic Peninsula follow in 2020. <coughs> So that is why I'm so excited 
that today these ocean legends have come here together to announce their intention to form a group of Antarctic champions to help make sure that the network of Antarctic MPAs is a reality by 2020. So first of all, I would like to welcome and introduce Jose Maria Figueres. He's co-founder of Ocean Unite and co-chair of the Global Ocean Commission. Mr. Figueres was the president of Costa Rica from 1994 to 1998 under a one-term constitutional mandate. And since leaving government, Mr. Figueres has served on numerous other boards and was appointed managing director of the World Economic Forum. Jose Maria, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Andrea. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon, yes. So you've quickly become a leading figure in ocean conservation. Um, you, met, you launched, helped launch the Global Ocean Co Coalition, Commission, sorry, which recommended how to solve some key problems facing the high seas. And you were also instrumental in how the, winning the designation of the Ross Sea. So I was hoping you could start us off a little bit by telling us about lessons you've learned from your years as a world leader and an ocean advocate, particularly your work on the Ross Sea, and how we should apply those lessons to achieving a network of Antarctic marine protected areas. Thank you, Andrea. Mm -hmm. um, let me begin by saying that I've worked many years in my life on issues of climate change, and it is only in the last five or six that I have become a convert to ocean issues. And some people say that there's nothing more dangerous than a convert, <laughs> uh, so be it. But I want to begin by recognizing the tremendous amount of acumen and work and research that has been done on ocean issues by all of you here this afternoon and probably many following us on the webcast. Um, Andrea, if we could do it all over, we should have actually called our planet ocean instead of Earth. Uh, it is the most important ecosystem in our lives. And the day that humanity realizes that the quality of life above the surface of the ocean depends on the quality of life beneath the surface, we will begin to become much more serious on how we protect our oceans. The Ross Sea experience, if I may call it that, in terms of helping the efforts of many people for that to be declared an MPA, took several ingredients. One, of course, is broadening understanding with respect to the issue of hand. Because the ocean belongs to all of us, it belongs to none of us, and we do not take adequate responsibility for our actions. So broadening understanding on this was a very important component. Secondly, grounding the necessity for this to be declared an MPA on science, on scientific research, is absolutely fundamental. Not only in this case, but in the declaration of MPAs going into the future. And thirdly, being able to get the message to the decision makers in which Slava here with us this afternoon was absolutely instrumental, I find goes a long way in terms of getting finally the job done and MPAs declared. Thank you very much, Jose Maria. That, that's excellent. I think we'll come back to several of those themes throughout the rest of the panel. Uh, next, I'm very pleased to welcome and introduce Mr. Lewis Pugh, who became his, began his career in international ocean advocacy, working as a maritime lawyer. And for nearly three decades, Lewis has been drawing public attention to ocean issues by swimming in some of the most vulnerable marine ecosystems. His unique brand of ocean advocacy, deemed Speedo Diplomacy, has reached millions worldwide. And in December of 2015, Pugh swam in Antarctica's famed Ross Sea to draw attention to the need for protections of these biologically rich waters. After the swim, he undertook considerable outreach efforts with key decision makers in Russia on behalf of the need for a large scale network of MPAs in the Southern Ocean. Hi, Louis. Thanks again for being here. Thank you. Um, so of all of our panelists here today, I think, in fact, more than anyone in the entire realm of ocean conservation, you truly lay your life on the line for, for the ocean. Your work and commitment to the Ross Sea were invaluable in getting designation for it. I remember 
When you did your five swims in the Rossi, you said it was one of your most dangerous swims ever. And it looked terrifying just to watch it on video. Can you tell us a bit about your Rossi swims and, and how you helped, how they helped you make the right connections in Russia? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I mean, just to explain how to get to the Ross Sea, it, it took 11 days on a fast icebreaker from the bottom of New Zealand. So you sail from 40 degrees south to 50 to 60 to 70, and eventually on the horizon you see, and it's just one of the most incredible sights on this planet, the, the, the mountains of Victoria land. And if you carry on sailing along the coast, eventually you come to this ice shelf. And it's literally like sailing up to the White Cliffs of Dover. Okay, enormous great ice shelf. And from a swimmer's point of view, there is nothing more terrifying. <laughs> I mean, it really, it is one of the coldest places on this planet. And this was the first time I'd ever taken my wife on an expedition. I was always frightened about what might happen. and never wanted her perhaps to see something happen. But on this expedition, I, I, I took my wife. It would take a month to get down there and then get out again. And... When we arrived there, the captain of the ship said, said to me, he said, Lewis, it is so cold down here that I think that the sea might actually freeze unless you get the, and we're talking about the top layer of the sea, you could actually see it becoming what is known as grease ice. So you look across, it looks as if somebody has put some oil over it, and it's just about to freeze. He said, please, just, just get the swim done and get out of here. So I said to my wife, I said, one of, one of the big fears you have as a swimmer is the animals in the water. I mean, it would be fair to say that there is no leopard seal in the Ross Sea or a killer whale in the Ross Sea that's ever seen somebody swimming past. <laughs> so you just don't know how these animals are going to react. And so I said to my wife, I said, please, Antoinette, I need you to go in a small zodiac. I need you to go along the edge of the ice and just make sure that there are no leopard seals in the water. <laughs> so I watched as she was lowered into the water in a, in a small zodiac, she went along the, along the edge of the ice shelf. And as the boat was lowered into the water, a wave hit up against the side of the boat. And it was so cold that some water splashed up and turned midair into slush and then hit her as ice. And you could imagine what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, <laughs> OK, the water is minus 1.7 degrees centigrade, 29 degrees Fahrenheit. The air temperature. <coughs> is minus 35 degrees centigrade. I'm going to be taking my hand and I'm going to be putting, I'm going to take my body and put it into, into 29 degrees Fahrenheit minus 1.7 degrees centigrade. And then I'm going to be pulling my hand out and putting it into minus 35. Yeah. And my wife came back and she looked at me and she said, OK, Lewis, we're ready now. And you know, it's the, it's, the, it's the moments which really challenge us the most, which define us. I, for those of you, and I'm sure there are many of you here who have been to the Ross Sea, it is the most special place on this planet. It really is. And if I was not prepared to get in there and fight for this place, then was I worthy of, of standing up and being a voice for this place? I just said to myself, I said, Lewis, just get in here and just do it. And so we, we went to the start of the swim, and uh, my coach just, just gave me the commands. I, I whipped off my clothes. As, as soon as your clothes are off, I mean, it's very, very difficult to breathe. I mean, it is so cold. I, I dived in. There's a very, very fine line between fear and panic. Fear is, <laughs> is healthy. Okay? It, it sharpens you up. Panic is absolutely deadly. For the first one minute, it was complete panic. I didn't even realize in the dive-in, I lost my goggles. Didn't even realize. I just swam as hard as I could for the first minute. At the end of the second minute, my hand was completely white, the same color as, as this table, completely white. At the end of the third minute, my arms were slapping the water. By the end of the fourth minute, my legs were scissoring. By the end of the fifth minute, I realized, if I spend another minute in here, I will never, ever see Moscow. <laughs> I will never <laughs> and I, I got out, and there's this photograph which was just taken of me in the boat being taken back. And that picture then was sent to Russia, and it was a picture of somebody in free, 
absolutely freezing on the edge of life and death. And I, I remember saying to Slava sometimes, sometime afterwards, I mean, the idea that somebody would go and do a swim in the Ross Sea as a private citizen and then go to Russia and try and influence Russian policy as a Briton at the height of the conflict, it, it sounds improbable. And you, you, know what, you know what Slava said to me? He said, Lewis, he said, all of us in Russia, young boys, young girls, all of us, our parents would take us to a frozen lake or to a river or to the sea. They'd cut a hole in the ice, and as young kids, we would always swim. And we had some idea of what you went through and your passion by that symbolic act. And because we both love sport so much, Slava is you know, one of the greatest ice hockey players in the world, and myself as you know, loving swimming. Immediately when I, when I met you, Slava, I realized that there was a bond. And, but for Slava's engagement, we would never, ever have been able to carry this message to the highest powers in Russia and eventually get it across the line. Thank you, Liz. That was fascinating and um, leads us perfectly, of course, into the introduction of Slava. It's my absolute honor and pleasure to welcome and introduce Slava Fatisov here today. He's a retired ice hockey defenseman and coach who has earned three Stanley Cups during his time as a player and coach <coughs> with the NHL. He also earned two Olympic gold medals, one silver and one bronze with his hockey career as both a player for the Soviet national team and the manager for the Russian national team. Slava is currently an acting member of the State Duma of Russia, one of the two bodies that make up the Russian Federal Assembly. And Fatisov has become passionate about polar conservation and have become a formidable advocate on behalf of the Ross Sea within Russia, with a commitment to work for long-term protections. So Slava, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Again, <laughs> my honor. You're one of the most famous hockey players in the world. You've won multiple Stanley Cups and Olympic medals, but truly, I think one of your most impressive feats was your perseverance in gaining permission for Soviet players to compete in the NHL. Because of you, a number of the top Soviet players joined the NHL, and some of the top players in Europe followed. And it was your dedication that broke that barrier. And similarly, you were instrumental for Russia joining uh, uh, endorsing the marine protected area. So the Rossi MPA was a huge win for ocean conservation. What was the winning play that got Russia, Russia to support the Rossi? And what will it take for us to do it again and again? Uh, first of all, it's a big honor for me to be here. Uh, it's probably better to talk about the game. <laughs> uh, by the way, it's uh, my last uh, time I've been here on the, on the stage it was 1998. Wow. When we beat the Capitals in a fourth straight <laughs> finals of the Stanley Cup, and I got my second cup, and uh, <laughs> after this I retired. For me, it's uh, Washington, D.C. It's last uh, city when I uh, play my last official game. Wow. I got lots of good memories. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> it's, I think it's uh, uh, one of the reasons I'm here. But uh, I think it's uh, Lewis. Uh, the way he talked about the, uh, this place, Antarctica, I, you, know, you cannot uh, fall in love with him. You know, you cannot uh, respect him as a uh, human being to try to, you know, think a little bit uh, ahead of the, uh, the time and everything else. And uh, of course, we become the good friends right away. Uh, this uh, uh, talk. Uh, like you know, it's you can picture right away what's what's uh, uh, Antarctica and how it's uh, we need to be together to to protect uh, uh, the planet. <laughs> and uh, you know, I see the penguins in the uh, uh, Moscow Zoo when I was a kid, and then I play against the penguins in the international hockey. <laughs> That's all I've been known about the, uh, these animals. But uh, uh, where he talks, you know, it's uh, how the the population of the pink is going down you know, dramatically, and you know, I can tell you know, it's uh, lots of changes in the climate. And uh, of course, uh, uh, I think it's to the sign the first time MPA 
to the uh, start the huge project to protect the uh, uh, Antarctica. It's uh, it's was an easy step, but uh, without uh, Luis, I think it's uh, been possible. And uh, of course, he came to Moscow to uh, to through our friends, you know, it's to uh, try to get the support. And of course, you know, it's lots of people was involved. You know, we met. Uh, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, it's Minister of Defense who is responsible for environment in Russia. And you know, we talk about uh, uh, how we can uh, get Russia to be part of it. And uh, of course, you know, it's <coughs> uh, finally it's they, they talk to him and the way he present uh, what we need to do together. You know, it's probably uh, make our country to, to be part of it. And I think it's in the future we can uh, do lots of uh, uh, things together. We believe in this, and uh, uh, like uh, <coughs> my first year in National Hockey League, I was Soviet major. I played for Red Army team, and of course, when you fight against communist system to get the, uh, for yourself open the new world, you know, it's a came to the Na National Hockey League in '89. I was 31 years old, and uh, didn't expect, you know, it's. Uh, uh, lots of success, but uh, those years in NHL started to become, become international uh, league, and the Soviet players was the first who come, and uh, uh, and then we start to form the teams. You know, it's uh, Alex Ovechkin, probably <coughs> one of the most uh, likable player now in uh, Washington, but uh, uh, in my time it wasn't easy, you know, because you know it's Cold War will still exist and. Uh, and even hockey players didn't like me because you know I came from uh, another part of the world. But uh, slowly and surely, you know, we become the uh, teammates, and we fight for the same goal. Uh, we fight against another team. We get the same uh, arrangement of the players from different part of the world. So, you know, we through the blood sometimes, but after the game, we go in. Drink the beer, talk about the common things, families, and you know it's a game and stuff like that. I think it's uh, the uh, I can transfer to the uh, what's happening in the Arctic right now. I think together we can do a lot, and uh, of course uh, this uh, attention which we see here in uh, uh, in the United States. I think it's uh, in Russia. We say if you got the one choice, that means you got no choice. You have to get. Uh, all together, you know, just to 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 protect the whole uh, Antarctic. In other words, uh, seven zones, six. <laughs> Gonna be it's a good challenge for everybody. I think it's uh, uh, ecology and sport can unite us. That's Absolutely. What, <laughs> but, uh, in my heart right now, and in, uh, in my soul, and uh, it's a big honor to join what. Uh, those two gentlemen who know more about the uh, environmental problems, you know, to be part of the, the whole team presented here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Slava. Uh, finally, I'm pleased to welcome and introduce Karen Sack. Uh, for, and I'm, thank you, Karen, for being with us today and helping convene this panel of Antarctic champions. Karen's the managing director of Ocean Unite, and she brings more than 20 years of experience working for international non-governmental organizations on environmental issues, including here at the Pew Charitable Trust, where she helped initiate the Global Ocean Commission. Karen has also worked for Greenpeace and is a member of the World Economic Forum's Expert Network. Karen has been passionate about Antarctica for as long as I have known her. She even focused her law degree on studying the Antarctic Treaty System. In fact, I remember when I met you, Karen, what, it's like 14 years ago now, you were working both of us were working on stopping illegal fishing for toothfish, which is known as Chilean sea bass here in the US, and the illegal fishing for that was rampant at the time. And you played a key role in helping to identify some of the illegal operators that were ultimately shut down. I'm curious how you think you've seen ocean conservation work change over the last 20 years, particularly in the Camelar Convention area, and what you think we need to do to get us to the network of MPAs by 2020. Thank you, Andrea. Um, such a pleasure to, to be with all of you today. And um, I think what Andrea has mentioned is when we met, I think she was called the, the toothfish lady here in the US, <laughs> and I was the toothfish lady in South Africa. 
And after you've been called that collectively, you know, you've, you've got a bond. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I, you know, I think um, just looking back, uh, there is no question that the ocean, which for so many years uh, was a what we would call an, an orphan environmental issue. It was very much out of sight and out of mind of most people. Um, anyone working on environmental issues was focused on forests or climate change. And um, we loved whales and wanted to protect them. Um, and that actually takes us straight into the Antarctic and what was going on there. But uh, for ages, there really wasn't very much attention being placed on the ocean um, until about six years ago, I think, that really did begin to change. Um, it was a result of the work of thousands of people around the world who've dedicated their lives, scientists, um, activists, advocates, and, uh, and more and more politicians um, who have begun to recognize the importance of the ocean uh, and also begin to draw together the links uh, between what is happening beneath the waves and the challenges that um, ocean life is facing and the links to climate change and overfishing and inequity, which is why we all got involved with illegal fishing and overfishing issues in the first place. So there's been this real sea change um, in how people are looking at the ocean. And I think that um, while you know, the, the idea to convene a Global Ocean Commission was brewed actually in this building here at Pew, um, and thanks to the support of, of a lot of the people who are here as well as people internationally, um, led to the engagement of the most amazing group of, uh, of leaders um, of which Jose Maria was one of the co-chairs um, and, and really started to set the bar um, as they began to understand what was going on in the ocean space and what needed to be done. Um, and since then, you know, have been joined by uh, Slava and Lewis and many others. Um, I remember having lunch with Lewis in, in London um, before he had decided to swim in the Ross Sea and mentioning that this area needed protection. And he looked at me across the table and he said, I'm going to go and swim there. And I thought, okay, you know, people say this, they don't do it. And next thing we knew, <laughs> there he was. So, you know, I think um, in looking back and looking forward, um, the ocean is definitely an issue that's higher up on the agenda. And with regards to the Antarctic, what we have absolutely seen time and again is how the policy space in the Antarctic and, and moves by the countries that are members of the Antarctic Treaty have led the way um, in international ocean governance, whether it was in tackling illegal fishing in the past and actually coming up with the concept of illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing, uh, to looking at uh, implementing prior environmental impact assessments um, and establishing the first protected areas in the high seas. Um, and that has spurred action really all the way up into the Arctic and, and at the UN as well. Um, which we are hoping to drive forward. Uh, and, and now we need to, to take the work in the Antarctic to the next level, which is hopefully what we can all do together. Thanks, Karen. Jose Maria, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit more about this Ocean Champions Group and what you envision um, you all can do together to get us to Antarctica 2020. With pleasure. Uh, and I hope that uh, Louis, who is the... Uh, chief instigator and head rabble rouser, <laughs> uh, besides being uh, the conceptualizer uh, of uh, this idea, uh, will also uh, jump in here. But uh, essentially what we have here is an opportunity to move the needle uh, with respect to the conservation of ocean space around Antarctica in a way that we have never done so before. And to be able to build on the success of having the Ross C MPA, which came into effect uh, now in December of 2017, setting aside between the sea under the ice uh, cap and the 
ocean, uh, the Ross Ocean, uh, two million square kilometers in upping up uh, the ante from two million to seven million square kilometers of ocean around Antarctica. Um, so what uh, Lewis has put forward and which uh, Slava, myself, others are committing to helping him with is this holistic vision to declare six more MPAs uh, for a total of seven with the Ross Sea by 2020 around Antarctica covering seven million square kilometers. Uh, that is a worthwhile objective. That motivates us to move in the right direction. And the reason why it's so important is because Antarctica is not only this pristine place on the planet which Lewis has so adequately described, but it's also important for what we know is the role of Antarctica in the global climate system. Uh, the ocean currents that develop in Antarctica are not only responsible for heat transfer around the world, but are also responsible for a lot of the biodiversity and the beginning of the food chain that eventually sustains all life on Earth. In the face of climate change, which is the big challenge that for the first time ever as humanity we face, how do we move from 200 years of industrial revolution into a new era of a low carbon economy uh, based on science, technology, offering new business models, opportunities for entrepreneurship, creating jobs, which is what we need to do around the world, and setting us on a completely different path from what we have traversed so far. In all of that, this idea of seven MPAs around Antarctica by 2020 is absolutely centerfold to what we can do in terms of combating and mitigating the effects of climate change. So I again want to uh, thank <laughs> our swimmer here, not only for his uh, swims, but for this wonderful initiative, uh, which he's inviting the world to follow him on and make a reality. Thank you, Jose. Lewis, would you like to say a bit more? Thank you, thank you so much. Can I perhaps just explain, because where the seven are, just so that, so that people understand that. Um, so we've got the, um, obviously the one down in, in, in the Ross Sea, and then there are the three areas which are part of the East Antarctica Marine uh, Proposal. So these three areas are proposed by Australia, France, and the European Union. Uh, we then have the one in the Weddell Sea, which has been proposed by the Germans and the European Union. We then have the one here in the Bellingshausen Sea, which has been proposed by Chile and Argentina. And there is a marine protected area, which I've been fighting for together with, right there. with Simon Reddy uh, up here. Nope, down lower. Where right there. There you go. Right there. there. Yep. <laughs> no, it's up here, isn't it? In order of magnitude, you're in the Down. right direction. There you go. <laughs> don't, don't worry about it. Right there. <laughs> Which is in the South Sandwich <laughs> Islands. Okay, so together, that's how we're counting our seven. So I know people say, okay, that's one. But I like the idea of seven. It's a good number. It's a seventh continent. <laughs> we've got one already. And then if by March, April, we've got the next one in the South Sandwich Islands, we've got two. And then if we can get the world to start talking, we've suddenly got five. And I always believe that momentum, there's a lot of power in momentum. And so then we can get the other ones squared away by 2020. And the reason why 2020 is such an important date is because this is a year, it's a 200 year anniversary of the discovery of Antarctica. So Antarctica was discovered by Admiral Belling, Bellingshausen in 1820. And I can't think of a more important occasion to celebrate and and an opportunity to not just reflect on what's happened over the last 200 years, but where we want this place over the next 200 years.
Perfect. Thank you so much, Louis. Um, I guess I'd want to turn to you, Slava, for one more question. And I, I'm curious what you think it would take for countries working together with Russia. Um, how, how do we do that more collaboratively as countries, as NGOs? And, and what's the recipe for success there to get these seven MPAs by 2020? First of all, 200 years ago, it's uh, Admiral Billingshausen says so Russian. Uh, cannot blame Russia, right, to open the. <laughs> but years ago, uh, Arctic, are you? No, no, no. No. <laughs> uh, I think it's. Uh, uh, you get a good example of the Ross Sea, how they work together. And I think it's more you're going to talk about, more you're going to uh, see the. the Big picture. I mean, as we all have to say thank you to the uh, Louis, you know, to do what uh, I mean, only uh, one man in, uh, in the planet do it. Uh, once he invited me to 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 go with him, I said, "Listen, it's two weeks of the uh, uh, sail on a boat. You know, it's it's too much time for me to just to get off my job, and I get I find a good excuse not to." Go with him down there and <laughs> <laughs> probably try to with a cold water. But uh, again, it's uh, uh, we should see the big picture. You know, it's uh, what how we're going to affect it if everything is going to be uh, going the direction uh, we see right now. It's uh, and uh, also you know, I have to <coughs> see the uh, the uh, uh, future for the kids and the grandchildren and uh, for many many. Uh, decades ahead, and uh, I don't know if I can uh, say and uh, to answer uh, your question. You know, it's uh, I, I invite uh, the Louis to be in the hockey team to play in the North Pole. You know, and at 2019, I try to bring the hockey game together, and uh, maybe Alex Vesh can uh, find the time to <laughs> to play. You know, it's uh, it's not only a hockey game; it's probably uh, more. Uh, Famous people we're going to be bring uh, on, a, on a project. The more we can talk about the future problems. You know, it's uh, because sometimes it's not affect you. It's uh, you don't care. But I born in Moscow. It's uh, when I was kid. Uh, we skate outside. <coughs> like example, you know, we skate outside uh, from uh, October until April. Now it's uh, only you can skate maybe one month. Uh, it gets so warm, and I'm gonna take what's going on around. You can uh, you can see you know how fast uh, things gonna be changing. And uh, the the famous Louis, you know, it's an example. You know, it's when he swim last year, right? Um, the same place. Can you tell the people? You know. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I was just Probably saying. Probably it's the best example, though. What do you need? Map? Yeah. This one. I, I, I was I was explaining some of the changes. Slava's suddenly become, um, with respect, bipolar. So he's suddenly <laughs> he's suddenly talking about the Arctic. Uh, but I uh, I was explaining that um, this is obviously the the North Pole here. And in 2005, I did a a swim on the island of Spitsbergen in 2005, and the water temperature there in July 2005 was three degrees centigrade. I went back there again last year, so that's 12 years later. The water is no longer 3 degrees centigrade. It's now 10 degrees centigrade in that part of the Arctic. So the enormous changes which we are now seeing in both parts of the world are astonishing. And our response has to be so much quicker than it currently is. That's the bottom line. Mm. How are going to affect the, uh, the rest of the planet? Uh, this will have an enormous impact on the, on the rest of the planet. So uh, you, you'll be able to detect from my accent that I, uh, I'm, I'm like Karen uh, from spend part of my life down in South Africa. I mean, we've got an occasion happening now which is called Day Zero. I don't know if you're all aware of what Day Zero is. We're the first major city in the world which is about to run out of fresh water, okay, out of drinking water. And so the government, the local government, has set the day in March, end of March, where they will turn off the taps, okay? And then you'll be allowed 50 liters, and there are a number of well points around the city where you can go 
with your uh, cans to be able to collect water. And I just think this is, it's an example of what we can uh, e expect in future years unless we all work together and we all start protecting our natural resources, whether it be in Africa, in the Arctic, in the Antarctic. It's a, it's a, it's a very, very good uh, warning, I think, of what we can expect in the future. Thank you, Lewis, and thank you, Slavos. And, and thank you again all for being here. We've really, this has been an extraordinary panel to hear all your different voices with your different backgrounds talking about the Southern Ocean. Um, I've learned a lot, and I'm looking forward to working with each of you on this Antarctica 2020 campaign. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. In two years, we'll mark the 200th anniversary of the discovery of Antarctica. That's a pretty short period of time in world history. But as these champions of Antarctica's future were saying, the time for international cooperation to help protect the global ocean is now. Thanks for listening today, and we hope you'll subscribe if you haven't already. We also love to hear what you think about the podcast, so leave us a review at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. For the Pew Charitable Trusts, I'm Dan LaDuke, and this is After the Fact. <laughs>